Good morning. Today I will be reading Exodus 3.14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent you, sent me to you. Good morning. How y'all doing? Good. Why don't we start with prayer? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to come here this morning and to worship you. And Lord, I pray that as we come before you and your word, that you would, through your Holy Spirit and through your word, teach us about yourself, that you would help us to truly understand you and understand your gospel. For we pray it in the name of Jesus and to the praise of your glory. Amen. I'm going to do something that should be taught in every seminary not to do. I'm going to ask you three questions to start with, and they are dangerous questions. You ready? Number one, what did I preach two weeks ago? This is why it's dangerous. <laughs> Anybody? Yes, Jesus came to save his people from their sin. What did I preach last week? What's that? Be holy, for I am holy. Correct. I love this. Someone's listening. This is great. Now the question, why did I preach those two sermons? I've mentioned that too. What's my goal? What am I trying to accomplish? Yes, to know God and to know his gospel so well that we become excited about it. That we really love God so much that it's like a grandparent with their first grandchild. And they say, by the way, I hear you have a grand new grandchild. Oh, yeah. And they pull out the phone and say, look at all these pictures I got on here. Right? That's what we should be. That kind of excitement for the gospel. That's why we are preaching and going through the things that we are doing. That is the foundation of everything that I'm doing. I want us to know God. And I want us to be excited about him and his gospel. Well today we're going to come to. We're not up here. I am who I am. Can we get that switched over? Don't think so. All right. Well I got my notes here. All right. <laughs> There we go. All right. Uh, and by the way, I put this other one up here. There is only one thing greater than happiness in the world, and that is holiness. I love that quote. Henry Drummond. Anyway, we're going to look at I am that I am out of Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. And the first thing that we really want to look at is the context. What's going on? Now, you're probably already familiar with this. Moses, as you know, had been rescued uh, from the waters, raised in the house of Pharaoh. Um, as he was a ruler, he killed an Egyptian because he, wanted, he was beating a, a fellow Hebrew. He was kicked out, going to be killed by Pharaoh, so he left. He's on the backside of nowhere raising some sheep. And it was a very humbling experience for Moses. And I'm just going to read uh, Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15, so we can understand a little bit of the context of what's going on. So now Moses was pastoring the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. That's pretty interesting. <laughs> so Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He also said, or he said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Now I want you to pay attention to the conversation that's going on between Moses and God in this context. The Lord said, I have surely seen 
the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. Now notice what God is saying so far, beginning with verse 7. I have seen the affliction of my people. I am aware of their sufferings. Verse 8. I have come down to deliver them from the power of the, from the, power of the Egyptians. I am going to bring them up to a land. Uh, verse 9. Uh, I have seen the oppression with, the, uh, with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. God's the one who's noticing everything here, right? He's the center of all this. He goes, I've seen the oppression. I've heard them. I'm going to deliver them. I'm going to do it. Now, Moses, you go and do this. And Moses like, whoa, okay, it's right good right up to that point, right? <laughs> You're going to do something. Now, wh where am I fitting into this? And Moses says to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? So Moses, again, Moses has really been humbled here. And he's like, whoa, if I go back there and I go to Pharaoh, he's going to kill me. That's why I left in the first place. You know, I've been back on the backside of nowhere, just raising sheep. I'm happy with this. I got married. I have a son. Things are going good. I don't need this kind of stress in my life. And, but God comes back to him and says, certainly, this is God speaking, I will be with you. Who am I, Moses said. God says, I'll be with you. It's almost like they're having two conversations here. God's always putting the focus back on himself. And Moses is thinking about himself. And so he says, who am I that I should go? And God says, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. That's a pretty certain thing. It's going to happen. Verse 13. Then Moses said to God, behold... I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has, said, has sent me to you. Now, they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? Now, why would Moses ask that? Again, think about the situation. How did the people of Israel get down to Egypt? It's through Joseph, right? Joseph was in charge. They brought the whole family down because of their drought, and they lived there. And then uh, uh, at the beginning of Exodus, there was a pharaoh who arose who did not know Joseph, and they enslaved all of them. And how long were they in slavery? 400 years. Now, we read over that sometimes. How long has the United States been a nation? About 200 and... Less than 250, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. 400 years they're in slavery and then God comes to Moses and says I'm going to send you to deliver my people you know from the most powerful nation on earth there's a reason Moses is saying who are you <laughs> who are you that you're sending me who's a nobody to the most powerful man on earth at the time to deliver a people who are slaves we've been in this situation for 400 years who are you, God? That's really what he's asking. Who are you? And I, he's not saying in a condemnatory way, I don't think. I don't think he's saying in a negative way. He's just like, we're slaves. We've been slaves for 400 years. Yes, our father served you, but we're slaves. And now you're sending me to Pharaoh to deliver them? What's going on? Who are you? How can this take place? And God gives the answer. In verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial name to all generations. And that is 
the name that is said, the Lord here, based on I am. Well, that's the context. So Moses asks, what is your name? And God answers, I am who I am. And that is translated as those four letters, which we really don't necessarily know the, know the pronunciation of. When Hebrew is written, they just had the consonants and not the vowels. And so we think it's Yahweh. But the thing is, as was mentioned in Sunday School in Job, every time that the Jews came to this name in their scriptures, it was so holy they did not want to pronounce it because they did not want to take it in vain like the Ten Commandments say you shouldn't do. And they were afraid if you pronounce it wrong, then it might take it in vain, not treat him properly, and therefore you'd be in trouble for breaking a commandment. So therefore, every time they came to his name, which was over 5,300 times in the Old Testament, they would not say Yahweh, they would say Adonai, which means Lord. And that's why in your Bible, in verse 15, most of you it will say, the Lord, the God of your fathers, we keep that same thing. It says the Lord and has Lord in all capital letters. That is the name Yahweh, but we kept the same thing. Instead of saying that, we have Lord, Adonai. Those are the, to, to show you just something as a side note, that is the four things. This is the vowel pointings that we put in when they're reading it and didn't want to pronounce it. They didn't put the word Adonai in. They just put the vowel pointings for those letters in there. A, O, A, Adonai. And when you put Y, A, H, O, W, A, H, you come up with, and run it through a couple of languages, Jehovah. So Jehovah is actually taking the name that God gave there, Yahweh, combining it with the vowels of Adonai, which means Lord, and that's where you get the name Jehovah. Side note. But what really is important is when God reveals himself here, he is giving us a very specific name. Whenever you introduce yourself to somebody, what's the first thing you do? You give your name, don't you? Hi, I'm Andy, right? Now, that's important not just because, oh, if you want to talk to me, there's something that you can call me to to get my attention. But especially in the Old Testament, names actually reveal something about yourself. My whole name is actually Patrick Andrew. Patrick means noble. Andrew means manly. I like that. So I'm a nobleman. <laughs> I just go by Andy, though. Anyway, <laughs> but when you give your name, there's a, there's a meaning attached to that. It, it's an identification of who you are, and even more so in the Old Testament. But what I really want us to notice here, that this is the name. When God is, when, when Moses comes to God and says, who are you? In effect, what he's saying is, hi, my name is Yahweh. But the actual meaning of that name carries a lot of depth to it, because it's not just, oh, please call me that which is true, and that's why I think it's important. It is a specific name that he has chosen for himself, for us to call him. It is for a personal God to reveal who has revealed himself in a specific way. Now, the reason I think it's, one of the reasons I think it's important is because like when we were overseas and you say God to a Hindu, they're going to say, which one? You know how many gods they have in, in, in Hinduism? 330 million. So if you just say God, they have no concept of the God of Scripture. If you say God to a Muslim, what are they going to think of? Allah, right? That is not the God of Scripture. If you say God to an animist, to a Wiccan, to a Buddhist, to any other religious group who is not a Christian, you say, God, what's conjured up in their mind is not the God of the Bible. And so if we are to use the term Yahweh, the name of Yahweh, then we start thinking, this is a person who has revealed himself through a name 
that I'm relating to. And it's a specific person who has revealed himself in Scripture in this way. And that's who I'm talking about. And we're going to look at some of the implications of that. When God says, I am, what does Yahweh mean? It's built on a Hebrew word called Hayah, Hayah which means is. That's where we get I am that I am. God, who are you? What's your name? I am. Does that help anyone? It really takes some unpacking, though, doesn't it? I mean, God has revealed himself before. For example, in Genesis 14, 18 to 20, he reveals himself as El El uh, Yon, God Most High. In Genesis 16, 13, he is El Roy to, to um, Hagar, uh, Sarah's maidservant. You are the God who sees, who sees me specifically. In Genesis 17, 1, El Shaddai, the All-Sufficient One, or the Almighty. In Genesis 21, 33, it's El Olam, that is the Everlasting God, or the Eternal God. Every one of those kind of has a, an attribute or something about God in it, doesn't it? Those names, and that's why it's a beautiful study to do the names of God. It gives you some of the understanding of who God is. But when you look at these names and you compare that to I am, it's different. Because when God says I am, the first thing that God is saying about himself in that name is I exist. And think of the implications of the fact that God exists. We usually don't think about that too much. Some people just take it for granted. Some people don't believe that God exists. But the fact that God exists, He just is God, is important for us to know. Some of the implications of, of this that I want to look at. Number one, what if God exists and we deny His existence? You know some people like that, don't you? Oh, I don't believe in God. Does that change reality in any way? You know, I can step in front of a Mack truck out here going down the highway and say, I don't think, you know, I don't believe the truck's going to hurt me. Does that change reality when the truck hits me? No. Why? There's a reality to it that what I think about it doesn't change. Whenever... God says that he exists, I am. And someone says, I don't believe that God exists. That does not change reality. But what does change is the fact that they will meet him. And when you meet God, and you realize that all of your life has been built on a lie, that you've blinded yourself to everything that shows that God is it's a terrifying moment. And I want us to be excited about God and His gospel so that everyone we know and come across, that we can share the gospel that God is. And He is a glorious God. And none of them have to meet Him without knowing about Him. Second implication. What if God exists and we just don't acknowledge him? In the sense that a lot of people say, oh yes, I believe in God. Or I go to church. I read my Bible. But he really doesn't make an impact on your life. An example by uh, John Piper that I really liked is a lot of people kind of treat God like water. Like H2O. Did, did everyone learn that water is made up of what? H2O, two, two atoms of hydrogen, one atom of oxygen. H2O, right? If y'all are still awake, nod your head. Yeah, okay, good. How many of you learned that in school? All right. How many of you, probably, <laughs> how many of you that made a dramatic influence in your life? How many of you learned that water is made up of H2O and that just changed everything? Not many of us, if any of us. Sort of. For me, I learned H2O. It's like, okay. It was just in my grade. 
<laughs> that's important. That's important. But for the most part, it's like you learn it and you say, okay, that's cool. I get it. I put it on my test. We're good. But then I go through the rest of my life. I don't think about it. I don't worry about it. I get on more important things. Why? Because it's just not important to what my daily life is. And a lot of times we, even many times we believers who come to church, treat God that way, don't we? Do you believe in God? Oh, absolutely. How much influence does he make in your life? Does he really change the way you think and the way you speak and the way you act and the purposes in your life? Or is he just kind of like H2O? Yeah, he's there. I recognize it. I get it. I believe it. It just doesn't have much to do with what I do in daily life. And when God comes to us and he says, I am that I am. I exist. The very thought that God exists and we acknowledge it should transform who we are and what we do and our motivations for everything. Third thing. If God exists, we are obligated to conform to his purposes for our creation. Now, I'm assuming, of course, we're talking about the God of the Bible here. Okay? And I do that in a couple of places here. But if God says, I am that I am, I just exist we must conform to what he has created us to be. We are not free just to conform ourselves to whatever we want. We are not free to do whatever we want. We are free to do what God has created us to do. Why? Because God exists. And like we talked about in Sunday school a little bit, the very fact that God exists changes Everything, including the purposes for our life. I was talking with Mark yesterday, and it was just, you know, he was saying, you know, if I introduce you to someone, how do you want to be introduced? Like, I'm Andy. You know, that's it. I'm not the Reverend Mr. Smart. I'm not, you know, even Pastor Andy, if you want to call me that, that's fine. Uh, I just go by Andy. Why? Because you and I are brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm no different from you. The only difference between me and you is the vocation, the calling that God has in our life. He has called me to preach and to teach in a position of pastoring and missionary and things like that. And that is my vocation. Yours is lawyer, teacher, farmer, rancher, things like that. And you're called to do that. But there's no difference in us other than the vocation. And each one of us is to be conformed to what it is that God has created us to be in the situation that we are. Second implication of the name that I am that I am. A name is a revelation of a person or a character. And this is so important. God is a person. And we have to start thinking of him that way. He's not a power, he's not a force, he's not a doctrine, he's not words on a page. He's a person. If you were to go to a Alcoholics Anonymous or any of those kind of addiction things, they'll talk about you have to look to a higher power. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But God's not a power. He is not something that we use to get what we want. He's a person. He's not a force. He's not like in Star Wars where they use the force, you know, to do something. He's not just something you tap into in order to have incredible powers. He's a person. I want to go out on a, a limb or as one of my seminary professors, you say, I'm going to draw, I'm draw a heresy circle and step into it for just a moment. But there's no such thing as the power of prayer. Why? Because God is a person. Prayer is not the power. There's power in us going to God and say, God, would you please do this? Because you're my father. You're God. You're the creator. Prayer itself? No. The only power is in prayer is the fact that I am going to God who has the power and authority to do whatever he sees as good. You see the difference there? And so it's not that prayer is good. It is prayer to Yahweh for his purposes. That's where power is. That's what we need to look for. 
And we need to relate to God as God. Relate to God as a person. It's great to read the Bible, to know the Bible, to know the way he has revealed himself in here. But this is not God. It tells us about a person. A real person. Yahweh. And we need to relate to him that way. And when we share the gospel with someone, what we share is a person. When I was a pastor in Missouri, when I first went in, they had a little bulletin board and they stuck in there about how to share the gospel. Is the ABCs of sharing the gospel. Admit, believe, confess. Admit that you're a sinner, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, confess your sins. That's a very simple tool, but it's just a tool. It has some problems with it. One, repentance isn't in it. Two, it doesn't tell you who Jesus Christ is. Because when we share the gospel, we're not sharing, here are six steps to becoming a Christian. What we're sharing is a person. God himself, in the person of Jesus Christ, who has revealed himself to us, that is the one who changes us. That is the one that we are going to become like. And that is who we want to introduce to people. This is, in case you can't tell, one of the passions in my life. I've been trained in many ways to share the gospel, and most of them I find personally lacking. They might be good tools, but unfortunately what they become is a formula. If you go and knock on doors and share these six scriptures and pray that they will, and they pray that they will receive Christ, you've got someone. No! why I started two weeks ago by saying the gospel is more than just forgiveness. It is introduction to and an intimate relationship with the person of God himself. That's what I want us to know. That's what I want us to be so in love with that we're just sharing that with people. Not because I'm up here saying you need to go share the gospel. No, but because it just flows out of you and the love that you have for him. Because motivation is important. But the evangelism that we do is sharing a person. The great I am. And that's why it's so important for us to treat him as a person. A person should never be ignored. Right? If you come up to me, by the way, I just want you to let, to let you know this, that in my manly mind, if you come up to me at Walmart, and I've only seen you at church, I may not recognize you because I have you in this little box that says you are at church. And I will not recognize you anywhere but at church. That's just me. I don't mean to be rude. If you say, hey, pastor, how you doing? I'll say, oh, okay, now I recognize you. So I don't intend to be rude. If I am, get my attention, okay? <laughs> I've had that happen before. That's why I'm, I'm saying that. But if you come up to me, and you say, hey, how you doing? And I just kind of turn and do this. How will you feel? Does that make you feel good? Why? Because I just ignored you, and that is extremely rude, isn't it? Now, if you ignore me, not that big of a deal. But if you go to... The president, no matter what you think of our president or whoever he is, if you go to the president of the United States and he says, hey, how you doing, Andy? And you just turn away. That's rudeness on a different level, isn't it? Because, as it says here, the greater the person, the greater the offense. And when God comes to us and he says, hey, I love you. And we just turn away. An infinite God that we have just offended is an infinite sin. It just ratchets it up every time. And God himself is infinitely great and loving and gracious every day. And we need to genuinely... Treat him with the respect that is due to a person when he speaks to us in the word. Third implication. As a person, 
God has no other influences outside of himself which cause him to be who he is. He just is the way he is. Now, what do I mean by that? If I say, hi, I'm Andy, and I can say, you know, I can tell you where I was born, Valley View Hospital, Nada, Oklahoma. I can tell you that I came from my parents, uh, BJ and I'm Gene Smart, and that's why I look the way I do. I will never look like Ryan Reynolds because I don't have Ryan Reynolds' parents. I don't have his genetics, right? So I look like me because I get some genetics from my mom and I get some genetics from my dad. They come together and voila, you have this. <laughs> You're stuck with it. Sorry. But <laughs> I can tell you about my friends. I can tell you about my high school and college and my experiences in ministry and in work and all these other things. And, and they form me into who I am today. All these things working together, right? What does God say to that? Who are you, God? Where do you come from? I am. He doesn't have parents. There's never been a time when he wasn't. He always is God. There's nothing outside of himself that he himself did not create that informs who he is. He just is the way he is with no influences outside of himself except that which he himself has created. So when you ask God... Who are you? What can he say other than, I am that I am. That's who I am. And you cannot go behind that. And that should just blow our minds to think on God like this. This can be referred to as a self-existence or self-determination. That is, the only answers that come about who God is have to come from within himself because there is nothing external to him. And that flows into number four, which is that God simply is. There is no explanation for him. Just turn real quickly to um, Colossians chapter 1, verses six and, uh, excuse me, 16 and 17. This is actually talking about Jesus, who is what? God the Son. Well, if I can find it, it's in my Bible earlier. Speaking of Jesus as God the Son, he says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Verse 16, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, where the thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him. And pay attention to the next three words. And for him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Think about the implications of that. Everything visible, God created. Everything invisible, God created. If God ceased to ex exist, you know what would happen to you and me? Poof. Because there's nothing to hold us together. The thing that we call life would be gone. Why? Because God is the source of all life. That's one of the in interesting things about the burning bush over here. I'm not going to say this is a correct interpretation, but I find it interesting. The bush is burning. It's not being consumed. What happens whenever you burn a piece of wood? Wood's consumed, right? It's fuel for the fire, literally. What happens when the fuel's gone? Fire's gone. God is a fire in a bush, the bush is not being consumed. In one sense, you can look at that and say, wow, that does kind of give a picture of the fact that God doesn't need anything else to exist. He doesn't have food. Nothing gives him sustenance. He just is God. And he doesn't need anything else. He's perfectly happy in and of himself. I better hurry. Number five, God is sovereign. If he is the uncreated creator with no outside influences causing him to be who he is except those which he himself created and gives existence and life to, then all things are the way they are because of him. He is the way he is because that's the way he is. And it is his system that he has created to accomplish his purposes. Now that opens a can of worms. That I will not get into today. But I would love to talk to you about it if you want to. 
But if in the beginning God created, then this is his system. In everything that takes place, it's God's system. And he has a reason that he has created it this way. And that's why I like what we've been doing in Job so much. Because Job was questioning God a lot too. Why is it this way? And God doesn't really answer. He says, I'm God. And that's a great answer. Because there are some things that God just says, I'm God. I don't have to explain myself to you. He does a lot of times. But he doesn't have to. Why? He's God. And we forget that so often. We become very familiar with God. And it's just like we come into his presence and we expect him just to do what, he, do what we want him to do and, and say what we want him to say instead of thinking, God, you're God. As it says in Psalms, he does whatever he pleases in the heavens and on earth. Anyway, by implication, that means that we must conform to him and not he to us. We are to be holy for he is holy. Not what we see so often in the world. Have you ever heard someone say, well, oh, I, don't, I don't believe in a God like that? Again, doesn't matter. The reality is that God exists and he exists in the way that he has revealed himself in his word. And when people say, well, I believe in a God like this, well, it doesn't conform to reality. And the same thing for you and me. If our understanding of God himself does not conform to the reality that God has revealed in his word, we need to change, not him. If something doesn't make sense in life, which that's a lot of things, it's not that God has to change to fit our situation we have to say, God, help me to understand you and your ways. I have to change. And that's part of God being God. Number six, that means we are not free to make Yahweh into our own image. We must accept how Scripture has revealed him to us in Scripture. In the context, what is that? We paid, some, we paid attention to that. What did God come to do at this point? deliver his people right i've seen the oppression i've seen what's going on he's trying to deliver them and when moses comes up what's the first thing god says to him no no don't come close take your shoes off what take your shoes off why because this is holy ground why because god's here so you need to come into the presence of god you need to prepare for that you need to take your shoes off and you need to get ready to come to the presence of god that brings up two issues. And that is, are we afraid of God's presence or do you treat him lightly? Great quote by Martin Luther is, says that the church is basically like, like a drunken German peasant. That you usually falling off on one side or the other. That is, you fall off on one side of legalism or you fall off on the other side of grace. And we need to have a balance between those. The grace side is that, oh, I can, you know, I'm saved, I can do whatever I want and God will be gracious and God will forgive me. And we just treat God lightly. And we have to be very careful with that. He is still God. On the other side, we say, oh, you know, it, it all depends on what I do. I have to pray just right, and I have to act just right, and I have to dress just right, and I have to do everything just right for God to accept me. No. By grace you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God. Not a result of work so that no one will boast. But we have to come into his presence. We have to prepare that we are going to the presence of God Whenever we pray. At the same time, he's our father that we can just run and jump on his lap and say, Dad, I got something great to tell you. Dad, I'm really hurting. Can you help me? But we need to have a balance in there of those two things. So we don't treat God lightly. But at the same time, we recognize him for who he is. Now, in the context, God is preparing to deliver his people from slavery. He's a God of deliverance. In the same way, Jesus came to save us from the slavery to sin. First sermon, Jesus came to save his people from their sin. And he's left us in sin a long time. Some of us longer than others. But he said, I came to deliver. And this is really glorious. Turn to John chapter 8. 
John chapter 8. <clears throat> Beautiful story here. It's a long chapter, so we're looking at uh, verse 53. The Jews come to Jesus and say, Surely you are not greater than our father Abraham who died. The prophets died too. Whom do you make yourself out to be? Does that sound like a familiar question? Who are you? Now notice what he says. Jesus answered, if, uh, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom, he's, of whom you say he is our God. And you have not come to know him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I will be a liar like you. Not how to win friends and influence people, by the way, but definitely truth. <laughs> but I do know him and keep his word. Your father rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, Yahweh, I am. He takes that name of God that is so powerful. That is the covenant name of God here in Exodus chapter 3. He takes it himself and says, I am Yahweh. And because of that, verse 59, they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out. And that is glorious. Because where Moses just took off his shoes to come into the presence of the Holy One, who just is, we can come into the presence of God because of His Son, Jesus Christ. We put on His righteousness. We put on His glory to come into the presence of God. We cannot be holy as Yahweh is holy. We can't do it. Because God is God and we're not. We are to be holy because God is holy because we are to reflect His glory. So why am I starting here with this? If I'm talking about us being holy and, and reflecting the image of God, why am I talking about the name of God which is not something we can reflect? It's because this is the foundation of worship. To think about God who is God. He just is the reality with whom we have to do. And the more we think on that, the more we understand that and try to massage out of the understanding and meaning that God himself put into it, the more we understand God, the deeper our worship, the deeper our love for him. And that is what I truly want us to know, to go deeper and deeper with God, to know greater and greater joy. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have chosen to reveal yourself to us and to do it in such a powerful way. Lord, I pray that you would work powerfully in us through your word and through your spirit to transform us into your image as you have created us to be, to fulfill the purposes you have made us for. And I pray that you would expand our minds and our understandings to encompass as much understanding of you as we possibly can. We pray it in the name of Jesus and to the praise of your glory. Amen.